Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. Interesting broadcast this evening as we look at the Ukrainian conflict and how it's shaping up to take a new front altogether. In fact, it's starting to look more and more as the advance on Russia's western border takes place there that eventually, as we announced yesterday after listening to one general saying he really hopes it doesn't happen, but he believes we're headed to war. And of course, that war that he's talking about is a war with Russia. But how do we end up in conflicts with Russia to begin with? How deep does this go? And that's something we wanted to take a brief look at with you as we look at the latest article here on RT News, Accomplice in Igniting War. Moscow says U.S. crosses a line with lethal arms supplies to Ukraine. Now, that's the latest thing that's going on is that the U.S. is uh, voted now to arm Ukraine with lethal weapons. And of course, as we reported just this week as well, there's been a lot of reports that Russian troops, tanks are also inside of eastern Ukraine in the Donetsk, Luhansk regions, which have declared their independence from Ukraine. And uh, maybe another reason why perhaps Russia moved part of its forces from Syria back to the homeland. Even though Russia is keeping two bases active inside of Syria and still helping President Bashar al-Assad fight ISIS militants and other militants in the region there, it clearly seems that Russia may have restaged their forces, 1A, as we have mentioned before, to move out of the way in the event that there is an Arab conflict against Jerusalem, or B, and could be both, that Russia has moved back to the homeland there because of the Ukrainian conflict rising, the tensions continuing to rise, and them knowing already that this was coming in the American politics that they would be arming Ukraine with, of course, lethal weapons. But what we wanted to look at is just how has this grown and why? As we can see in this article here, December 22nd, 2017, NATO tri tri uh, tripled military presence on Russia's border in just five years. Why are we continually to build up? After all, Russia, why is Russia considered a threat? Is it Eastern Orthodox beliefs? I believe that has a lot to do with it. Now, the Vatican and the U.S. would argue that it's the spread of communism. But communism has always served the Vatican well. As we know, the Vatican had two of their own Jesuits, Stalin and Mussolini, who ran the Soviet Empire, the communistic nation, whereas Russia before the fall of the Tsars was considered a Christian nation, always trying to spread the gospel at least the way they believed it to be perceived. And that's been in contradiction with that of what the Roman Catholic Church has had in mind of the way the gospel should be spread. If we go back, I shared this article with you guys, gosh, a couple of years back and everything. This is from PressCore.ca. It's a, a Canadian source here. Catholic Church declared and waged war against Ukraine for daring to exit the EU. This is back when it talks about Pre President Viktor Yanukovych before he was uh, overthrown by the Maidan coup. He said he announced on November 21, 2013, the majority elected Ukraine government was abandoning an agreement that would strengthen ties with the Catholic Church founded European Union. Originally founded by Pope Pius XII, oddly enough, in 1942 as the European Economic Community, or ECC, as Catholic Cooperation Initiative based on Catholic social teaching, and instead to seek closer cooperation with Moscow. The Ukraine government new alliance with Russia was seen as a major public embarrassment for the Catholic Church. It took the Church, Catholic Church over 60 years to, to form the Vatican occupied Europe, the EU, the Catholic Church wasn't about to let one of its occupied European states to leave the Vatican Fourth Reich. Now that's the way the article reads it, as far as the Fourth Reich, things of that nature there. Uh, but the point is, though, this is not just some rogue Canadian website that is really slandering the, you know, throwing, throwing the dirt on the Catholic Church, but there is multiple evidence to support exactly what they're saying. This here is an example right here. Back in 2014, September 15, priest blesses Ukrainian troops. Military chaplain prays for peace amid shaky ceasefire. 
Well, we also find out in this video, and I'm going to play just a brief few, uh, uh, couple of minutes here of this for you, is that the Catholic Church had, it had become officially recognized the priest and the blessings of the troops. And that's the Roman Catholic Church of Western Ukraine. Listen to this. The Ukrainian Defense Ministry approved the decision to organize a special priest service to operate in all military divisions. Since the majority of Ukrainians are Christians, Representatives of the Orthodox and Catholic Churches took part in the project, meant to give military chaplains an official status. That's just one to kind of give you the idea there of what's going on there. And also, though, it's no different from the Russian Orthodox side on the far east of Ukraine. And you got to remember, this is why the trouble is so great. The church split a thousand years ago. Uh, President Putin has been trying to help reunite the two sides there uh, with Pope, uh, Pope uh, Francis here recently and in, in years there, but there's still a major division. And of course, at the, also during the time that uh, Catholic priests were blessing the soldiers of the Roman Catholic soldiers on the western side of Ukraine to fight eastern Ukrainians, and then the priests were also, the Russian Orthodox priests were blessing the soldiers that were fighting against western Ukraine. Take a look at this one. The whole point is, is that both church and state have united and fighting one another. What's really the purpose of all this? It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Moving on over here to the article here by Avril Manhattan. Uh, Avril Manhattan was the world's foremost authority on Roman Catholicism and politics. Uh, of course, he was born in 1914, died in 1990. He also uh, operated a radio station called Radio Freedom Broadcasting to Occupied Europe. He was the author of over 20 books, including the best of the Vatican and world politics. By the way, his books are not very well appreciated by the Catholic Church nor the Catholic community uh, and have been uh, the number one on the for Forbidden Index for the past 50 years. And when you read about what this man writes about, you can see why. In this particular uh, articles here, he deals with... Uh, uh, how religious pamphlets and radio broadcasts convinced one million Catholics to leave North Vietnam and live under Catholic rule in South, overwhelming the Buddhist. Uh, basically, it was a Catholic war. Much what we're seeing in Ukraine. It's all about preserving Roman Catholicism throughout the entire world. And also what I've learned from reading... Um, uh, what Mr. Manhattan wrote in his uh, books, etc., is that it's interesting to see how that the Catholic Church will be involved in a particular group in a government until they lose control of it. As we mentioned before, uh, the two leaders of Russia that really galvanized uh, Russia into a, to the Soviet Union was, of course, Stalin and Lenin. Both of these men were Jesuits, but once it had gotten completely out of the Vatican's control to try to, to stomp out Eastern Orthodox or Russian Orthodox uh, uh, beliefs, then communism grew completely out of control for, uh, for the Vatican and its influence began to spread after World War II. Uh, this is also where Mr. Manhattan begins to write more about the Catholic influence there and what they were trying to do in order to stop the advance of communism inside of Europe as well as Vietnam, other places around the world. But basically what it comes down to, the Catholic Church just wants to dominate the entire globe from what I can see at, at, any, at any rate there. Uh, kind of giving you a little bit of an example here, the Vatican-American Grand Alliance, this is where uh, Mr. Manhattan writes about that, how that alliance came to be, and it was actually after World War II. Uh, but what I'd like to share with you, just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of what he talks about here, uh, let me just read to you this little bit right here, a little sec portion of this. The U.S. was the only military power sufficiently strong to challenge Russia's expansion in Europe. The U.S.-Vatican partnership had proved an undisputed su success from the very beginning. The prompt uh, creation of political Catholicism on the part of the Vatican with its launching of Christian democracy on one hand and the equality prompt economic help of the U.S. 
to a ruined continent had stopped a communist takeover. But if the U.S. Vatican Alliance had succeeded in Europe, the problem in Asia was more complicated, more acute, and more dangerous. A direct confrontation was possible, not only on a political grounds, but also on a military one. This proved by the fact that the U.S. had to fight a true war in Korea, as already mentioned. The lesson Korea was not easily forgotten. The U.S. saw to it that the vast, unstable surrounding territories did not become the springboard from which another ideological or military attack could be launched to expand communism. When the situation in Vietnam therefore started to deteriorate and the military in uh, inefficiency of the French became too apparent, the two partners, which had worked so successfully in Europe, came together determined to repeat in Southeast Asia the success of their first anti-communist joint campaign. True, the background and the problems involved were infinite and more complicated than those in Europe, yet one, once a common strategy had been agreed upon, the two could carry it out, each according to its own capabilities. So it clearly shows, Mr. Manhattan clearly shows the alliance that the Vatican forged with the United States. Now he also talks about in his writings here how the Vatican had forged a relationship with fascism under Nazi Germany, Pope Pius XII, very instrumental in building this together. Uh, but the, according to his writings, he claims that the church, they lost control of it when Hitler took power and of course advanced the Third Reich into a world war, um, World War II there. Who really knows how all of this works out? But the clear point in all of this is that um, this man, Mr. Manhattan, really identifies just how powerful the Pope of Rome has over uh, nations, in fact. And uh, one other quick little section here I want to read here. Uh, no, uh, not co content with this, Our Lady of Pier Wait a minute, let me back it up just a little bit. The following year, 1950, and he's going to talk about the Lady of Fatima and how the Catholic Church used this supposed miracle to rally the Catholic people to be able to fight for those things that they wanted the U.S. to fight for. The following year, in 1950, the Pilgrim statu uh, statue of Our Lady of Fatima, who had started to travel in 1947, the very year the outbreak of the Cold War, was sent by an airplane accompanied by Father Arthur Brassard on the direct instructions of Pope Pius XII, and of course they went to Moscow. That was kind of throw some sand in the eyes of the Soviet Union at that time says, but anyway, goes on says, not, not content with this, Our Lady appeared in person 15 times to a nun in the Philippines. She repeated her warnings against communism, after which a shower of rose petals fell at the nun's feet. An American Jesuit took the miraculous petals to the U.S. to revive the energy of the fanatical Catholics, headed by a criminal Senator McCarthy and many of his supporters. American warmongers led by prominent Catholics were meanwhile fervently preparing for an atomic showdown with Russia, top Catholics in the most responsible positions were talking of nothing else. On August 6, 1949, Catholic Attorney General McGrath addressed the Catholic stormtroopers of the U.S., namely the Knights of Columbus, at their convention in, in Portland, Oregon. He urged Catholics to rise up and put the armor on of the church militant in the battle to save Christianity, of course, meaning the Catholic Church. He further urged a bold offensive. Uh, so this is exactly what the church has been involved in. So that same year, another Catholic, one of the most highly placed uh, per personages of the U.S. government, James Forrestal, the crusader against communism at home and abroad, helped Pope Pius XII to win the elections in Italy by sending American money plus money from his own pocket. James Forrestal, who was very frequent contact with the Vatican and Cardinal Spellman, knew better than anybody else what was going on in certain Catholic American quarters. For one simple reason, he was none other than the American Secretary for Defense. You see, so this is just how involved the Catholic Church has in governments all over the world and their influence that carries on. And the U.S. is still being used by them until this very day. It may look like there's a little rift between President Trump and that of Pope Francis, but it's not. It's all going just as planned. That's one thing you can certainly believe in. And notice that as well. America meddling into the politics of the Italian government. Wow, I thought only Russia did that. 
Uh, who knows? Moving on, let me just kind of share with you another story here. This is by Carl Bernstein. The cover story, The Holy Alliance of Time Magazine. Boy, I can remember this. I actually cut, it, cut the article out years ago and had it saved for many years. I have no idea what it did with it, but I had it saved for many years. So only President Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II were present at the Vatican Library on Monday, June 7, 1982. It was the first time the two had met, and they talked for 50 minutes in the same wing on the Papal Apartments. Agostino, Cardinal Casaroli, and Archbishop uh, Achiel Silvestrini met with Secretary of State Alexander Haig and Judge William Clark, Reagan's National Security Advisors, by the way, are both Catholic. Uh, most of their discussions focused on Israel's invasion of Lebanon. Then in its second day, Haig told the them Prime Minister Menachem Begin had assured him that the invasion would not go further than 25 miles inside of Lebanon. But Reagan and the Pope spent only a few minutes reviewing events in the Middle East. Instead, they remained focused on a subject much closer to their heart, Poland and the Soviet dominance of Eastern Europe. In that meeting, Reagan and the Pope agreed to undertake a clandestine campaign to hasten the dissolution of the Communist Empire, declares Richard Allen, Reagan's first national security advisor. This was one of the great secret alliances of all time. Again, another prominent Catholic. Now, President Reagan was not Catholic, oddly enough, but everyone in his administration was, and therefore, in fact, he was also the first president to take his oath facing the obelisk in Washington, D.C. That was something that was spoken about by uh, a former Jesuit uh, that had said that the day that a president takes his oath facing an obelisk, that would be the day that the Jesuits have taken over America. Well, President Reagan was just exactly that man. So as you can see, all these wars are driven by this one thing in mind. And that's wherever Rome has the authority and control. And when they don't have the full authority and control they want, then they make sure that we war against those nations to get that control. Syria, by the way, is no different. Um, this article here coming out on Haaretz, this here, and I want you to see this as well, Syria's Assad has taken over the border region, presents Israel with a moral dilemma. Now, this actually goes hand in hand. This is actually breaking news coming out just, re just today, here on December the 23rd, 2017. Syria's Assad is taking over the border region, presenting Israel with a moral dilemma. What does he say? The return of Assad's regime to border areas could ensure greater stability and block the flood of Sunni jihadists into the area, but there is a catch. On the Syrian side of the border, in the northwest part of the Golan Heights, and the Syrian army has returned to its old ways. Army units surround small Sunni villages and give them an ultimatum. Surrender, swear allegiance to Assad's regime, or face annihilation. Step by step, Syrian President Assad is recovering territory that was wrestled from him during the Civil War. The Syrian army and militants Militias operate in coordination with it now control 70% of the country and the most of the population is now under his rule. In the summer of 2015, before Russia's military intervention, Assad controlled only one quarter of the country. So you see, Russia has really stood back up, but not so much as a spread of communism as it was years ago, and this is what the Vatican was supposedly trying to fight was the spread of communism because it had gotten out of control from what they created. That's something that Mr. Manhattan failed to point out, that the communistic nation was created by Rome to begin with to break the back of the Russian Orthodox Church. My wife grew up under communism. She was in Czechoslovakia. And of course, yes, they had to swear allegiance to Stalin and Lenin inside of their schools. And as she pointed out, the only church that had the right to exist publicly was the Roman Catholic Church. Not even a Russian Orthodox Church could have the practice as the Roman Catholic Church had. So, uh, once they lost that control, though, and the communism began to spread, and it went beyond the bounds of Roman Catholicism that could be controlled, that's when everything suddenly changed. And the same thing goes on with this whole issue about the Sunni villages that they're writing about here. Why? Sunnis are loyal to the Vatican. Shiites are not. And so therefore, anywhere there's a Sunni, you can count on one thing, the Vatican will protect them. Maybe not so much for the Christians in the area, because if they're not Roman Catholic, then I guess they feel like they're not worth saving. 
That's pretty sad, though, in my book. If you're dying for Christ, you certainly are dying for a worthy cause. You're worth saving, in my opinion. But anyway, that's just how these battles are going down religious lines. Very sad indeed. EU triggers unprecedented proceedings against Poland. Sanctions could follow. That's another interesting issue right there, and it's because uh, they, they say it's because of their laws are not in reform or not in cahoots with what they're wanting to do. But the real reality of it is, is Poland refused to take in refugees. They want to be terrorist free state. Well, I don't guess Rome's EU, European Union, is going to be settled, satisfied with them being a terrorist free state. Instead, they want to make sure they take in their quota of Muslims. The Sunnis, in fact, who are loyal to the Vatican. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom.